roll up the windows and keep quiet. Written by Paul W.S. Anderson and directed by Russell Malkahy, Resident Evil Extinction is a third entry in the film series, loosely based on the video game series of the same name. Starring Mila Jovovich, Oded Fur, Ian Glenn, Ali Lanta and Mike Epps, it follows a band of survivors trying to find safety during the zombie apocalypse. I had a very expansive vision for the third movie. It's set in the desert, in the daylight. This is not a conventional zombie movie. Pre-production began in 2004, immediately after the release of Resident Evil Apocalypse, which, in addition to the first film, we've already covered in videos I'll be leaving links to below. Anderson's first draft was a horror that ended with Alice turning into a giant, mutated creature, something Miller wasn't too happy about. After re-watching Mad Max 2 The Road Warrior, he became enamoured with the post-apocalyptic setting and began incorporating that into future drafts. Busy working on other projects, including a remake of 1975's Death Race, which we also covered last month, he hired Australian filmmaker Russell Malkahy to helm Extinction, citing his amazing work on 1994's The Shadow and the Highlander series. I read it, I was just so happy because it was such a great script. When we had the first meeting with Russell, he literally came in with a, with a book that size and he had took us shot by shot, scene by scene through the movie, how he would do it. Russell immediately created a storyboard of Anderson's script and suggested the film should mostly take place during the day, something few horror films had been able to master. There was a point in the pre-production process where we got scared of shooting in the daylight because the dark is it's easier to be frightening in the dark. And he said that he wanted to do something different and making a horror movie in the daylight hours was what would make it very different. Shooting was actually going to take place in the Australian outback in 2005, but production issues caused him to switch locations to Mexico the following year. Most outdoor sequences were shot near the city of Mexicali, while scenes taking place indoors were filmed at sound stages in Mexico City. As it contrasts the first two films, very bright, dry, arid landscapes, and then you've got that contrasted with the high-tech interior of the Umbrella Corporation. So visually, I think it's really interesting. Production designers were tasked with not only creating new sets and environments, but also had to recreate environments from previous films, including the laser room in the mansion. We're shooting at Churubusco Studios in Mexico City, which are huge. That's where Total Recall was shot, and uh, they're some of the biggest sound stages I've ever seen in the world. Miniature and scale models were used to accomplish the establishing shots of the buried Las Vegas Strip, while partial replicas of the Eiffel Tower and other monuments were also built. Although, you know, CG is very important to these movies, obviously we've tried to, you know, be as practical as possible whenever we can. They built an amazing Las Vegas set. Photograph the main strip model with this computer-controlled camera, and then add in background, sky, some trucks driving, and we've got this grand scale of the Las Vegas strip covered in sand in a photo real way. Makeup artist Bruce Filler, who worked on Army of Darkness, was in charge of the zombies and mutated creatures, including the two variants of zombies and Dr. Isaac's tyrant form. Most of the CGI and visual effects were handled by Weta Workshop and Mr. X Incorporated, but some effects required interesting practical solutions. Due to the protected land they were shooting on, miniatures had to be built and blown up by a pyrotechnic crew in other locations. The pyrotechnicians are up there rigging it right now. High explosive on the shell of the truck, and then gasoline bombs and mortars inside the truck. Set five years after the events of the previous film, Extinction quickly shows how the T-Virus spread from the streets of Raccoon City to the entire globe. In addition to turning most of the world's population into flesh-hungry zombies, it had drastic effects on the world's geography, drying up water sources and transforming entire countries into desolate wastelands. 
virus didn't just wipe out human life. Lakes and rivers dried up, forests became deserts, and whole continents were reduced to nothing more than barren wastelands. Since the Raccoon City incident, Umbrella discovered zombies can survive without the need for flesh, prompting them to research a reversal serum. Using antibodies from her blood, I will develop a serum that will not just combat the effects of the T-virus, but potentially reverse it. They also continue unethical experiments under Ian Glenn's Dr. Isaacs, including attempts to clone and weaponize Alice. The Doctor leads the hunt for Alice, whose blood may be the cure for the virus, which is odd because he let her go at the end of the previous film. Let them go. Are you alright? Program Alice activated. He's also trying to domesticate the undead by returning a bit of their intelligence, leading to some unintentionally hilarious moments. This is amazing. He knows what it is. Meanwhile, Alice roams the Mojave Desert, fending off bandits, thieves, and starvation. This is KLKB. We have seven people here in need of urgent medical attention. We need help. Please help my baby. You bitch. You dropped my baby. Nearby, a convoy of survivors led by Carlos, LJ, and Claire Redfield look for safety and supplies. This is Claire Redfield's convoy. Present location, the Desert Trail Motel. Broadcasting for any survivors. Is there anybody in there? Seems quiet. Yeah, don't they always? She ends up teaming up with her old friends, rescuing them from infected crows using telekinetic powers that make no sense. And together, they try to reach a supposed safe haven in Alaska, but must stop in Las Vegas to scavenge for supplies. Tracking Alice's movement, Isaac unleashes a new intelligent variant of zombies to attack the convoy and disables her, but she manages to overcome the conditioning and repel them. What is it? Satellite. Some kind of malfunction. As Dr. Isaacs flees to his nearby outpost, Alice and the crew follow, enabling the survivors to flee via helicopter. However, after discovering the corpses of her clones, she stays behind and heads into the secret lab for revenge. With the help of one of her clones, she's able to defeat a heavily mutated Isaacs and vows to hunt down the rest of Umbrella. Expect results within one month. Oh, you won't have to wait that long, boys, because I'm coming for you. Be bringing a few of my friends. Honestly, Resident Evil Extinction was a risky move, considering it deviates so much from the tone of the previous movies and the games. While the first was a straight-on horror film, and Apocalypse, arguably the most faithful to the games, raised the stakes in action, Extinction feels like a slow road trip. Instead of putting the emphasis on the undead, Extinction tries to anchor itself firmly in the post-apocalyptic genre, where survival in the face of dwindling resources is far more terrifying than a flesh-hungry zombie. That is until things get boring and zombies are thrown back in. The narrative is punctuated with exciting moments of action and entertaining set pieces, but it veers into absurdity before the halfway point with Alice's ridiculous powers. It also refuses to tie up loose ends from the previous movies, a condition that worsens with every other film in the series, which almost completely disregards what came before. Alice's abilities are an inconsistent MacGuffin, a narrative shortcut used by writers that don't know how to properly resolve a story without, you know, plot magic. Powers need restrictions, that's why Kryptonite was eventually added to Superman comics. Abilities need to be specified and we need to know the limits so we can follow the story and know what the stakes are. The action looks amazing, but it's meaningless if she's not in any danger. Ultimately, the writing is where this and most Resident Evil films fall apart. This is baffling to most of us fans because we know that there was never any need to create a new story when the games are so rich in character, lore, and history. Miller has a strong presence and undoubtedly carries the series, but making her the ultimate Mary Sue is catastrophic to her character, robbing her of agency. Ali Lata's Claire Redfield was added to replace Fiona Gullery, who was unable to return as Jill Valentine. But while both their characters are featured in the games, unlike Sienna, who studied and embodied her character in Apocalypse, Ali barely resembles her video game counterpart here. It's Resident Evil by six degrees of separation. Carlos gets a hero's end, and Ian Glenn is solid as Dr. Isaacs, but the other characters are woefully boring. Even LJ is reduced to a sideline character that gets bitten by a zombie and uncharacteristically hides it, putting everyone at risk. 
Extinction is thrilling some of the time, and a worldwide outbreak was something I was on board with, but they shot themselves in the foot with the frenzied cutting and shaky camera work, and by not dedicating at least a third of the film to showing how the world fell and what happened to our heroes in the interim. Despite its flaws, the film is impressive to look at. Director of photography, David Johnson, showcases impeccably framed shots with desaturated but warm colours, capturing the arid and barren post-apocalyptic visual tone. Russell blends the zombie and apocalyptic genres sufficiently well, but lacking any character development or video game accuracy, Extinction is definitely a step back from the previous film, which at least tried to incorporate elements from the games. 